Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Thought Leaders Series, Geosynthetics and Coastal Structures. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, Engineers Australia would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. Today's webinar is being supported by Engineers Australia's long-standing industry partner, Geofabrics. Geofabrics has been in the business of geosynthetic engineering and building key infrastructure across Australasia for over 40 years, operating in various sectors with expertise in roads, rail, coastal, waste, defence and mining. They aim to help their customers deliver and maintain infrastructure by minimising risk, increasing value through the innovative use of geosynthetic product solutions. Geofabrics has supported the Australasian infrastructure sector on significant projects from the Victorian level crossing removal to APLNG in Queensland and the Christchurch gondola in New Zealand. On these projects and every project they undertake, they have a singular focus to protect, contain, and secure the physical environment for future generations. Today, we will hear from two speakers followed by an audience Q&A and I encourage you as always to send your questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box. To kick off, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Simon Ristal, Coastal Consultant, Geofabrics Australasia. Simon has over 40 years of involvement in the evolution and development of geosynthetics. He was responsible for establishing Australia's first non-woven geotextile manufacturing facility and has been involved in major port and coastal projects over the decades, including the Narang River, Training Walls, Port of Brisbane and Townsville Port Expansion. Simon holds a Master of Technology and Innovation Management and has been instrumental in developing and advancing coastal solutions and geosynthetic material science. Simon has been an active participant in Standards Australia CE20 for geosynthetics for over 25 years and there is, is a member of ASIGS and OST IECA. Please welcome Simon Ristal. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to this presentation on geosynthetics in coastal applications. Reflecting on my 42 years in this industry, I thought it was appropriate that I should acknowledge some special thanks to three key people that have played a heavy influence in my professional life. Namely, Christian Pelagic, Christian from Delft, uh, afforded me a lot of time during the 1980s and introduced me to the massive storm surge barriers in the Netherlands. And that always provided inspiration for what could be achieved in coastal engineering and geosynthetics. George Hareton, both a friend, colleague and mentor, uh, was outstanding in his leadership for myself with geosynthetics um, since 1986 when we first met and we share a mutual uh, appreciation for all things nautical and maritime. A little bit closer to home, Angus Jackson, who I first met in 1982, has been inspirational in thinking outside of the box and our approach to coastal management systems. So to you three gentlemen and many others that I've met over the years, I appreciate your guidance and uh, um, interaction in these, uh, in these industries. So geosynthetics, uh, most of you are aware, they come in a diverse array of forms providing critical solutions, anything from roads, railways, landfills, mining, erosion. Um, and, uh, but today we're focusing specifically on coastal applications. Just to set the scene, I'd like to differentiate between some of the key geotextiles that we look at. In the non-woven sector, we see two main styles of manufacturing technique. On the left-hand side is what we refer to as a staple fibre, needle-punched, non-woven. 
On the right-hand shot is what's referred to as a continuous filament, needle-punched, non-woven. Now, both have their place, and we'll see a little bit later in this presentation why in certain applications, I have some reservations and concerns about the use of continuous filament non-wovens. At the other end of the spectrum for reinforcement, high strength uh, applications include such products as woven geotextiles and geogrids. Australia, it's an island nation. We're dependent on our ports, we're dependent on our ships and harbours and for commerce and trade, yet we're also very vulnerable to the extremes of weather and cyclones. Modern technology gives us the ability to monitor much of the sea state through systems such as wave rider boys, um, which I always quite, find quite fascinating uh, to watch their activity. And certainly we can see some extremes during major weather events. But what does that mean for us? Well, it really translates to what is the condition of the beaches and how do the coastal practitioners plan for adequate foreshore dunes and sand nourishment on those beaches? Because in the event of a major event, such as this image from Surface Paradise in the 1970s, the damage from cyclonic activity and large sea states can be devastating. And whilst that's 50 years old now, uh, we shouldn't be complacent because recent East Coast lows in New South Wales just show how aggressive and damaging these conditions can be. When we look at this aerial shot, we can start to appreciate how difficult it is to manage the coastline. We can see that retreat isn't an option. Uh, the infrastructure, the housing, the road, the services, which are um, potentially impacted by these high sea states um, cannot be ignored. They cannot be easily relocated or replaced. So um, we really do have to understand how we manage our coastlines and what options we have. Now, obviously a traditional rock seawall provides a, a wonderful defense mechanism. And with that, um, an element of uh, security and a sense of safety. But obviously there's not a lot to be said for the beach amenity or public access. If we look at the very early applications of geosynthetics in Australia, probably the first example of a major Port development would have been the Port Kembla coal loading facility built during 1978 and 79. And this incorporated very large prefabricated 1200 and 2000 GSM staple fiber non woven geotextiles, ballasted with concrete armor units and then um, placed directly in the um, excavated trench in the surf zone. Uh, and I might add aggressively on top of um, a lot of blast furnace slag, so a very aggressive environment. Jumping forward a few years and back on the Gold Coast, we had the um, natural Narang River um, bar crossing, which was marching northwards from Surface Paradise uh, into South Stradbroke, and plans were made to stabilize the Narang River entrance with the construction of the Narang River training walls. This is an important project because uh, the structure was built on a staple fiber 1200 GSM geotextile. It was a large project at the time and, and this was also a significant catalyst for the establishment of the first non-woven geotextile manufacturing um, facility in Australia. Looking at the completed project, and I'd just like you to pay attention to this a little bit because um, on the top of the screen, just south of the southern break wall, we can see the jetty there. That is in fact the sand bypassing jetty. Uh, we know that on the Gold Coast, we have roughly 500,000 cubic meters a year of northerly littoral drift of sand. 
so that sand needs to be intercepted and bypassed um, otherwise that uh, entrance would um, close out or become problematic. A few years later we saw an ambitious um, project by the Port of Brisbane to reclaim nearly 220 hectares uh, through the um, Port of Brisbane expansion project. Um, this was a particularly challenging project for a couple of reasons. Uh, it was constructed over very soft marine clays of um, significant depths. It was also sitting adjacent to the Moreton Bay Marine Park. The foundation of the wall reclaim perimeter was constructed over a high strength geotextile reinforcement shown there in that base red line. The sand fill was then introduced with a geotextile filter placed over that and then the rock armour. And this was achieved utilising large prefabricated uh, panels of geotextile, uh, predominantly in the order of 40 metres to 60 metres in size and weighing in the order of three metric tonnes. And here we can see a good example of that panel deployment by barge. This was the same methodology applied for both the high strength and the non-woven filter panels. Looking ahead 20 years and uh, this recent Google image um, shows that that uh, reclaim is nearly complete. But given that 20 year time frame, it also uh, gives you a um, perspective in terms of forward planning and uh, long-term investment. Um, but the port continues to be uh, a growing and very busy um, uh, facility for uh, the state of Queensland. I'd be remiss not to note that uh, whilst we're really looking at the, the hydraulic side of geotextile applications, very often on the inland side, uh, we have very um, high traffic loads and uh, frequencies. Often this is um, necessary to be reinforced using, for example, high strength woven geotextiles to ensure that we have long-term serviceability of these port facilities. Alternative methods do exist to build these large berms, walls, perimeter walls, and one of those which we see being quite popular, particularly in uh, Southeast Asia, is the use of large geotubes. Um, and uh, these can be hydraulically filled and used to form a perimeter berm, then infilled with sand, providing a cost-effective structure for major walls. And here we see that working example of that cross-section um, at Matabari Power Plant in Bangladesh. Similarly, uh, these types of structures can be used to aid in uh, building confinement um, uh, coffer dams and uh, to assist in you know, building bridges or major uh, infrastructure like this. One of the most recent projects uh, from a coastal port expansion in uh, Australia has been the Port of Townsville expansion project. Um, port of Townsville's uh, port sits directly on the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, so environmentally it's very sensitive. Uh, here we see an aerial shot of the main rock perimeter wall completed um, in readiness for the dredging from the port's um, deepening and widening of the uh, channel structure of which the dredge spoil needs to be placed. Uh, in there for the reclaim. Why is this of significance? Well, being uh, a fairly high tidal range area, 67 metres up there, um, we have a rock wall and uh, we need to ensure that when that dredge spoil comes, um, comes in, we're not creating a contamination uh, of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. So um, water quality control uh, is, is critical in this application. You can see here the contractor uh, uh, has gone to some lengths to uh, ensure high accuracy of placement um, of the geotextile with the overlaps and preliminary ballasting of the tow, um, as indicated uh, in that photo there. But as we saw, 
this extreme damage which we can experience on the coastline doesn't improve amenity. And in fact, the Gold Coast, for example, has suffered um, for many decades uh, from following the 1960s construction of the Tweed River walls, which um, uh, for those outside of Australia, Tweed River sits in New South Wales as opposed to Queensland. Therefore, it became a political hot potato when the Tweed River retaining um, training walls started uh, holding back a significant amount of sand, which would otherwise naturally have come around uh, the point into the southern Gold Coast beaches. So the serial shot here shows a nourishment program um, to infill those cells between the two groins on the southern side of North Kira there, and you can see how badly denuded the uh, northern beaches are there. Why is this significant? Well, it was always known to be a temporary structure, and uh, the North Kira geotextile groin, which was the largest uh, of its type built, um, then um, was 115 metres long and built from sand-filled geotextile containers. So we're seeing that defence doesn't prevent erosion. And here we are north um, of Surface Paradise at Naranek, severe erosion and lack of amenity on the beach. But Gold Coast City Council, uh, being typically proactive, implemented the Northern Gold Coast Beach Protection Strategy, combination of nourishment, but importantly, from a geosynthetics point of view, the nearshore submerged Naranek artificial reef which was an ambitious project utilizing large sand-filled geotextile forms. Bit of an overlay of what the structure looked like, cross-section of some of the typical mega container sizes, which were placed by Fukong, a split hull trailer suction dredge um, using differential GPS uh, for accuracy of placement. And uh, this has been built in minus two to minus 10, um, and I think these pictures give you an idea of the scale uh, of the structure itself. Um, the intent was to hold on to roughly 20% or 80 to 100,000 cubic metres a year of that 500,000 cubes, which were um, naturally travelling northwards. The evolution and development of these uh, large non-woven mega containers also resulted in export opportunities um, and projects such as this at Sabanias in the UAE, uh, incorporating the same mega containers. What we saw around this time was an evolution of the style and format of the geotextiles and the first application of composites for geotextile sand containers. These were also applied around about the same time as Naranek in 2001 on the first groins using 2.5 cubic meter containers at the Maruchi River. Alternate solutions, whilst not a pure geotextile, I would be remiss not to at least introduce the concept of products like rock bags, uh, because these are essentially a geosynthetic material utilized to contain rocks, which can be um, easily filled, lifted, and placed for a variety of applications, um, emergency works, working platforms, um, bioengineering. And I think a very good example is one from Bluemont Industries job in New South Wales, these emergency works um, where there was no other access to uh, save these houses during one of these um, East Coast low events, and they were craned in, pre-filled and craned in over the top of the houses. Um, just highlights um, the flexibility of this technology. From a ports and harbours point of view, though, I think these types of products, uh, along with Geotextile sand containers have application for uh, sheet piling and scour holes, uh, particularly where in areas which are subject to um, uh, a lot of prop wash from um, both tugs and uh, bow thrusters, etc. But let's get back to the nitty gritty and understand um, you know, some of the critical uh, aspects of geotextiles in, uh, in these seawalls because all, we all want a good outcome, a controlled, well-engineered geotextile and rock revetment. And in order to do that, let's get back to some basics. Let's understand what's happening when we drop a, drop a rock. We need to understand what the subgrade is like. Is it soft? 
Is it likely to deform? Therefore, we need to understand the characteristics of the geotextile, particularly its elongation, uh, its bursting strength. If it was a hard layer, well, the requirements are slightly different because the geotextile is subject to potential splitting and might be better measured by grab strength or tensile strength. Consider also the presence of stones in the foundation because they can create sharp edges which could damage or tear the geotextile and also the steeper the slope, there are greater forces acting on that. From my experience, uh, we can get close to recommendations based on formulas, design, experience, but we always, quarries are different, rocks different, subgrades different. Um, the cost of the geotextile is a very, very small part of a major structure like this. And in my experience, um, we've always conducted field trials. Uh, Port of Townsville, Port Kembla, Port of Brisbane, all conducted field trials to satisfy the client and the design engineers about the survivability of the geotextile. And where did the guidelines come from? Well, in one case, Geofabrics um, in Australia conducted full-scale drop tests in order to uh, derive some uh, understanding in terms of deformation of geotextile. And from that, we were able to um, establish some design charts regarding impact energy, drop height, mass of rock. And from that, we can relate to um, various characteristics of the geotextile. This information, I'm not going to dwell on the detail, it's all available um, readily online. Uh, but as I said, it forms the basis of that initial uh, selection criteria. Once we know that the geotextile is going to survive, what else are we considering? Well, we need to understand the pore size. Transmissivity, the in-plane flow of the geotextile, this is often overlooked, but particularly where you get a lot of wave activity and potentially rapid drawdown, the in-plane ability of the geotextile to transport water is critical. We're going to look at abrasion resistance and um, some of these other characteristics here. So getting the filtration design right, there are um, very reliable guidelines available to get this, but particularly diff difficult soils and conditions might require hydrodynamic sieve, sieve testing um, and uh, just for proof of uh, selection there. People often underestimate the um, uh, waterborne sediment and wave action can abrade geotextiles very quickly and an incorrect selection can result to premature failure. This is a continuous filament, non-woven geotextile. You'll remember from the beginning of my presentation, uh, I advised that um, there are certain areas where these should not be used and this highlights the reasons why. Alternately, if we conduct correct abrasion testing such as this, where the top picture of the geotextile is um, as presented to the abrasion tester, the bottom picture after 80,000 revolutions, alternating 5,000 um, every uh, change of direction, a 1,200 gram staple fiber geotextile is uh, literally undamaged and presents um, in its original state as compared to uh, the alternate product which we considered. UV testing, um, durability, particularly in geotextile sand containers is a, is a big question. And, um, you know, laboratory testing, accelerated uh, down on arc type machines are great, but they're often quite expensive. Uh, we also rely a lot on real-time exhumation of structures. And um, this gives us a good understanding of the geotextile polymer makeup and durability. So if we look at environmental aspects of modern geosynthetics, and this is quite a, um, an interesting topic at the moment because uh, people are often questioning uh, microplastics. And my comments on this would be, if we get the engineering of the polymers right, if we look at the abrasion resistance, if we look at the UV stability, if we look at decades of demonstrated exposed durability, then correctly selected geotextiles provide, um, you know, a great long-term performance with confidence. And there's a lot of information available from the International Geosynthetic Society, IGS, and their um, sustainability page on microplastics. 
And I'd also bring to the discussion, let's not forget the problems of microfibers and microplastics that are exacerbated by single-use consumer plastics. No one really thinks about vehicular tyre wear entering our stormwater systems, laundry fibres, and not to mention the human disregard for rubbish disposal, which we can all see on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, sadly. So let's get our um, design and detail right, top and toe overlaps, and where appropriate, so in panels. I see so many failures still with overtopping or inadequate toe design. Don't be shy to ask for prefabricated panels from uh, your geotextile supplier. Uh, these can go a long way to improve uh, cost and um, efficiency. Something often overlooked is uh, the concept of top hats, for example, around pipes and piles. These can be easily fabricated to ensure integrity around these structures. Uh, working case here at Shoot Harbour a couple of years ago around these piles, prefabricated pile caps being placed. Again, another barge deployment of uh, high strength geotextiles, factory fabricated. So very quickly, just looking at geotextile sand containers or GSCs, um, Australia had experience with uh, early installations in the 80s, predominantly tubes, um, some smaller uh, products. And the problem we were faced with was we really didn't understand why these structures didn't fail. There, were, there was no engineering science around looking at this seawall, emergency seawall, reach it all before the groins. Why didn't it fail? And in reflection, if we went back to another project at Stockton in New South Wales, uh, several years before, this was a temporary structure, double stretcher bond, uh, laid on geotextile, supposedly had a design life of um, six months. It endured a number of storms, including an East Coast low that um, grounded the Pasha Bolka. And yet 22 years later, that structure was still in place. So this raised questions about um, ensuring the improvement of these geotextiles, the composite 1209 and 809 RP type products, um, which highlight the ingress of sand uh, into the structure which works with and protects the geotextile. And as applied in the uh, 2.5 meter containers, which we see at Maruchidor. But we needed to understand why these structures didn't fail and a major program um, was commenced with WIRL in New South Wales and these uh, products were tested um, in scale to failure and that gave us the confidence to establish design curves um, which we could then take to engineers to assist them in uh, designing with confidence and importantly led to opportunities to help for example our Pacific Island neighbours where there is no adequate rock available and uh, geotextile sand containers play an important role in these sorts of structures, small boat harbours, sea walls and climate change adaptation. Another example from the Solomons on a, a runway extension, again no rock availability. So after 20 years we see a lot of public support for geotextile sand containers and um, a strong campaign uh, where uh, people did not want to see rock on the beach at Maroochydore and there was an upgrade to the Maroochydore groins in 2020 um, and 2022 including uh, extension of the seawall there. There's a very dynamic uh, entrance at Maroochydore for those of you not familiar with it. So just to finish off, looking at Elko Rock as a green solution, this is a project in Aspendale, Victoria. Um, in its early stages of construction, originally they thought they wanted a rock wall, but uh, they, um, Council wanted to put in a geotextile sand container wall. Several years later, when we look at that, we see 
high accretion of sand, natural vegetation, um, and improved use of the amenity, as you can imagine. North in uh, Muskers Beach in Yapoon, a similar approach was taken, whereby the wall was deliberately vegetated and uh, provides for a very, very agreeable um, solution. But it doesn't end there because one of the unexpected outcomes was also the marine growth on the geotextiles on the Narrow Neck Reef, such as these shots, all built on the geotextile mega containers. And it's a very, very pleasing environmental outcome. And this leads us to the question to finish of what comes next? I don't know. There are a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts. There are a lot of materials which I would like to explore further. These might be something as exotic as um, basalt uh, fibers, for example, or it might incorporate something like the GeoCorral Secure um, Electrolysis Project incorporated with jet textiles. Um, these are all exciting opportunities as far as I'm concerned. And I would encourage the, you to look further um, at the IGS, uh, both Australia and the international chapter, and follow the geosynthetic news uh, if you have um, particular interest in geosynthetics. I thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Simon, for your presentation and insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Angus Jackson, Founder and Chief Executive Engineer, International Coastal Management. Angus is the Founder and Chief Executive Engineer of International Coastal Management, a global leader in coastal management and winner of the recent ReBeach competition in California. Angus has been involved with geosynthetics and coastal structures for over 40 years and has designed and constructed numerous, often innovative, coastal structures constructed with sand tubes, sand bags, and mega sand containers. Benchmark projects include the North Kiro Grind, Narrow Neck Multifunctional Artificial Reef, Maruchi Grinds, and the Sabanias Reef break Breakwater that develop construction methods and or geosynthetic materials. Please welcome Angus Jackson. Thank you, Amanda, for the intro. Uh, Simon's done a good job of the presentation, so I only need to add a bit of history, an overview of some selected projects, summarise the present state of the art, and uh, a brief look into the future and a bit of prod to the industry. Most of the projects have been detailed in conference and journal papers. So I'll give a link at the end. Don't get too stressed about trying to, trying to grab them. As Simon said, there's two main applications. There's geosynthetics for a filter layer. That's very common in the industry and has been for 40 years. Uh, the other one, the more interesting one to me is the Sandfield geotextile containers. Uh, I'll quite often use FFGC as a shorthand for those. There's basically three types of geotextile containers. There's the tubes, there's the bags, and there's the mega containers. The evolution of Sandfield geotextile containers in Australia, Australia has been steady over the last 40 years. Uh, top left there, you can see the 20 to 30 kilos Hessian sandbags. They've been around for almost ever. Um, and that was the start of my career with Sandfield geotextile containers. I got to fill them as part of football training when I was at school during the 1967 storms along the Gold Coast. 1982, when I was a junior coastal engineer with Gold Coast City Council, we started to develop our own tube technology for small, low crested groins. Um, only problem with those is if they were punctured, you lost the whole structure. 1985, we had a problem at North Kira, we needed a temporary groin for what we thought was five years, but turned out to be more like 10. Uh, we built a 100 metre long groin, 12 metres wide at the base, six metres at the top, uh, that took us through that temporary period. 1985, Geofabrics introduced the 1.5 cubic metre bags into Australia at Stockton. I understand, and Simon will correct me if I'm wrong, that they've been used in Europe previously. So they were a known quantity. 
2000, we developed mega containers and, and composite geotextile for the Naranek multifunction artificial reef. 2001, we did the design for the Maruchi groins using the new 2.5 cubic meter bags developed by Geofabrics. And in 2020, we're now able to use off the shelf five cubic meter bags. 2020s, I'm hoping to see the new technologies such as geo coral and basalt fiber. Just looking at sandbags, I mean, there's photos back in 1922, top left hand photo there from Northern Beaches, Sydney, um, bottom left, Gold Coast. Over the right, 2016, Northern Beaches, Sydney, 2016 storm still being used. They're about 20 kilos, easily handled, very labor intensive, which makes them labor expensive unless you've got volunteers. But one thing for 20 to 30 kilos is they're very stable and well stacked when well stacked. The next evolution was the North Kira groins. We bundled the 1.2 meter high tubes together to form a well, the largest sandfield structure in the world at that stage. Um, it was built in the dry. You can see the top left where we pumped up a beach and then built the groin very quickly over a couple of days. Well, it had to be quick because we, our sandbar was eroding. On the right, you'll see the, the work that we did with RL to model it. And it was surprising. What we did find was, being engineers, we asked the, the lab to crank up the biggest wave that they could get at the end, and it ended up peeling the top layer off. And that, that is exactly what happened in the real world after a couple of years when the top layer was damaged and, and less well filled and floppy. Bottom left there, what did surprise us was the amount of um, public use that the, the groin got. We, as engineers, we're used to groins being a structure to hold a beach for the public, but the structure became part of the, the usable area and the kids loved it. They, they went sliding along it with the waves. I must admit, I tried it out uh, just to make sure that uh, it was safe. It was very safe. So what we end up with a low crested structure. So with a small footprint as a temporary structure, lasted 10 years had very low visual impact. The next evolution was Naranek multifunction artificial reef in about 2000. Took a couple of years to build in stages. It was designed and constructed using mega containers, about 300 tonners, um, various sizes to get the shape right. The containers were designed to fit in the hopper of a trailing suction hopper dredge. You can see that top right. And the idea of that was we could fill off the sand offshore and bring it into the surf zone and place each bag in a pre-location accurately to the right height. And as a result, the cost was $45 a cubic meter in place, which was about half the cost that we could get rock in a quarry not in place at that stage. The result was a project that was low cost, had a submerged crest, had huge environmental benefits and was very safe for users. We were very concerned with that as being the prototype reef, the legal aspects. If we killed someone or someone was killed, who was responsible? The answer is usually the engineers. So we were very careful to get a, a relatively smooth structure that was, if you hit it, and I have a few times when it's sucked dry, um, it's not like hitting rock. We did find that um, it overachieved in, in some respects. As you can see there on the left side, we've now got a wide beach in front of Naranek. Uh, previously, there'd been no beach at high tide. But also on that slide, you can see uh, probably about 20 or 30 boats out fishing. The problem, problem, the good problem, was that the geotextile formed a, a great substrate for marine growth that attracted fish and other marine life, but that attracted fishermen when there wasn't a surf. 
and fishermen come with anchors, hooks, spears. On the right side there, you'll see a patch. We developed how to patch these mega tubes underwater, a screw and, a screw and glue technology that worked really well. That graph on the left shows the, the bag laying. First couple of years, we laid about 400. Then there was a couple of small top ups as the, the reef settled and some of the bags were, were damaged by fishermen. And then 18 years after the start in 2018, there was a major top up of almost 100 bags. On the right hand side, you can see the white bags on the crest. And it was a slight design change as well to improve the surfing conditions. We've never got the perfect surf there, but we have created an improved surf. Uh, you'll see in that left hand side, top of that photo, there's a buoy there. One thing council did do then was reinstate the no anchoring buoys, which has kept to a majority the anchors off the reef. The next evolution was 2001, the Marucci groins. They were constructed of 2.5 cubic metre bags. ICM did the design. Um, the size was around the filling and placement. They need to be either filled and moved with a, an excavator. You can see the excavator there in the photos placing the bag. So they walk out on the, on the groin and place it very cost effective way. Um, again, gives us a low crest. You can see the surfer walking out on the bags, uh, not something you can do with a rock groin. Um, very safe. We did find in our early days of stability analysis that the top bags were going to be unstable in major events and would need to be put back. The client agreed that that was a reasonable trade off for a soft structure. 2018, we did maintenance investigations. There'd been a fair bit of um, displacement of the bags. Council was looking at whether they could take the next generation technology and restack the bags in a more stable configuration or with larger bags. I think Simon's mentioned this, but the fabric and most of the bags were in good condition, um, but being displaced more and more. Bottom right there, you can see there was a fair lobby group about um, don't rock Marucci. Uh, public did not want a rock solution. So we were striving very much for a, a stable bag solution, which ended up being the 10 tonners. The technology in Australia and the, the successes led us to a lot of work in the Middle East. Uh, this is one of them. I'll, I've just cherry picked them. This is Ab an island off Abu Dhabi, low crested breakwaters. Top left, you'll see the model testing that we did at WRL again um, of the bags. They were three bags wide, 300 tonners again, about 40. Interesting project. Uh, as you can see, bottom left there, there's a hotel there. So we had an eight week design and construct limit. We turned the job down a couple of times, which I regret in hindsight because we lost two or three weeks because the the end date was fixed in stone. The ruler of the UAE was going to open that hotel with a beach on a certain date. Um, our crew walked off went the barge from the island at about six o'clock one morning and about an hour later the ruler and his entourage ordered the barge and opened the hotel. So it was it was tight. The way we achieved that was we we air freighted the 40 bags, which Simon Restall arranged. Um, as they came out of the plane, truck to site, filled, and hey, we did it, eight weeks. Um, don't want to do too many of those again. Uh, it was low cost, it was about half the cost of rock because rock wasn't available on the island or within hundreds of kilometers of the site. It would all have to be shipped in from somewhere like Saudi by barge and then offloaded. The other thing is um, 
It had a very small footprint. And you see the bottom left, there's a, a rock reef that drops off. On the outside of that reef, the environmental assessment found about 300 of the endangered Hamor groper. The, the rock solution would have covered that habitat, uh, little caves and areas like that, that the Hamor were living in. This, we were able to keep it on top of the rock shelf and have a very low profile. With the rock, if you're sitting on a deck chair near the pool, you'd look out to see and not see the horizon, but you'd see rock. With this, you looked out over the top of the bags and didn't even see them. So it had huge aesthetic and tourism benefits as well. The next evolution and overseas project was some groins and headlands in India. The local Indian contractor actually came up with a brilliant idea for filling the 1.5 cubic metre bags. He made a form, put it on the end of an excavator, uh, dug it into the, the sand stockpile, then sewed the end of the bag closed and then extruded the bags into place where he wanted them. It turned out to be quick, low cost, low crest, very user friendly and safe. Hotel Najman in the UAE, Terminal Wall, another interesting project. Hotel Builder came to us during construction of a, well, probably a seven star hotel. Uh, he bought 300 deck chairs and umbrellas, but he didn't have any beach. On the right hand side, you can see the waves breaking on the near shore submerged breakwater that we designed and the new sandy beach that was imported. Um, the interesting part of this was that we had to guarantee a minimum 20 metre wide beach at any time after any event. So what we did was we built a, a terminal wall 20 metres out from the, the hard wall so that there'd always be a perch beach. Uh, it wasn't a highly structural wall, so we built the, the core out of open form trap bags. But then for user friendliness and somewhere for tourists to sit, covered the, the trap bags with five cubic metre bags um, that have never been exposed. Abadali Resort Island, groins and breakwaters. We custom designed uh, a hopper to, and jet pump for rapid filling. Uh, again, time was, was short. The scope was big and growing by the day. Uh, you see down the bottom the near shore breakwater and the villas. Bit of a challenge. Um, this project was awarded the accolade of the most luxurious project in the world by Newsweek back at the time. Um, and we still managed to save the client money over rock. It was low cost, low crest, user friendly, safe, and again, environmental benefits. The next project was a hotel beach wall in Dubai. You'll see in the top left there the erosion during a Shamal storm, which left the hotel with no beach, which the clients got very aggro on social media. Um, we needed to restore that and stop them losing their palm trees quickly. Worked with a local contractor to build a two and a half cubic metre bag wall. Normally, they're, they used to be called five tonners, but they're really closer from the work that WRL did to four, four and a half ton. It's quite quite a decent stability. Um, bottom left there, you can see the users. Um, they use it as a step, somewhere to sit, uh, fits in with the resort theme very well. The other interesting thing with this project was it shows the, the geotextile we're using from Geofabrics. It was all imported from Australia. It was colored to suit the local sand color. They didn't teach me that at university, but it works very well. So a lot of the structures we built there are hardly visible. So again, we end up with a low cost, cost low crest, user-friendly and safe solution. Tanzania, uh, one of our clients in the Middle East had a resort in Tanzania that he was building, needed groins and a wall. So what we did was we, it had to be user friendly. There was existing groins there that were very unuser friendly. We built gabion core rock 
for the core and then covered them with the two and a half cubic meter bags uh, as a soft walking and sitting area for the, the tourists. You can see on the right, the back wall. So again, sandy, uh, we've got the composite bags on top that are exposed. You can see the, the single layer, normal geotextile on the bottom, all trying to blend in with the sand, but not quite getting there in this case, but not bad. Uh, again, low cost, low crest, user friendly and safe. I seem to be repeating myself there, but that's what we were finding. Noosa, groin some wall, probably about 10 years ago. On the left, you can see walkers and fishermen out on the, the end of one of the, the groins. What was interesting about that project on the, the right, you can see a, a patch. What we're finding was the fishermen loved the structures, but they were digging holes. They were cutting the geotextile with their knives, digging holes in and putting their rods in. Um, so the council kept patching them till Simon Restall came up with a solution. And you can see there in the middle with the rod, a prefabricated rod holder, cut a hole, dig a bit of sand out, screw it in. Fishmen don't have to do it, and it's structurally sound. Again, very low cost, low crest, user friendly and safe solution, but it does need maintenance. So not only we, ICM has a lot of um, tools in their tool bag, Sandfield Geotextile containers are one of them. We very much go for engineering with nature solutions. Also found that we need to go with people-based solutions. No use coming up with a coastal management structure that is unsafe, unfriendly, and you see a few photos of there of people using them. So there is a trade-off. They're, they're softer, they do need maintenance, but they become part of the solution. Design. Design's a real issue with, with bags, tubes, and mega containers. 2001, we did a lot of research for Marucci, identified sort of adjusting rock design and um, taking empirical data from structures that we'd seen either fail or not fail. Um, and then in 2016, we much, did a much bigger study. We need to flume, so we teamed up with Griffith Uni. They provided an um, undergraduate student and a wave flume. Uh, for you who in the industry will recognise Zoe, who's now the, the senior coastal engineer at Gold Coast City Council. So we obviously didn't break her. Um, it was a really interesting project. We came out with a lot of um, answers on design of walls. On the right there, you can see the failure modes, overtopping, puncturing, pull out, which is an interesting one. The bags actually get squeezed out like a orange pip and end up on the beach in front. And then the wall sags and you get overtopping and of course, scour, toe scour. Um, further research has been done for geofabrics by WRL. Um, they're all available. Numerous publications available, but no simple guidelines yet. One simple advice is don't use rock equations. They're not rock. Designed for mega containers, been a lot of work done by the likes of um, Gary Mocky, Rancher Swass Smith um, on modeling the stability of the mega containers. We work with them, Wally Parsons, on our reef design for Dubai. And bottom right there, you'll see an output from Geocops. So you take a certain size container, the, the perimeter length, and you can work out the exact size depending on the, the fill ratio. So you need that if you're trying to get a reef crest at the right height. So the final takeaway from design is sand fill geotextile containers are not soft rock. Um, I've got an example there. Use the appropriate vehicle. There's different uses for different things. Geotextile for some, rock for others. 
environmental. That was our big surprise. We found that um, the geotextile formed a great substrate and but that caused us problems with fishermen, but it became a, a popular dive site as well. This is Naranek, um, all sorts of, so it's not a fish attractor, it's a fish habitat, a marine habitat. So this was one of my favorite projects to monitor. So if there was no surf, we dived it. We also did a lot of work in the Middle East on what grew on different geotextiles. See bottom right there, we've compared rock substrate with two di different geotextiles to understand what we're going to end up with. And I thank GHD and Nikhil for their marine biologists who identified the various critters for us. So the present, we've got over 40 years of experience with the design and construction of these sand-filled geotextile structures. They're very suitable for low crested. They have a small footprint and they're definitely a people-based solution. They have a lower project life cost in general. They're easily removed and modified, which often makes getting approvals easier. And many of the more innovative pilot projects most likely wouldn't have proceeded with more conventional hard materials. But they need monitoring and maintenance. They need specific design and construction methods. There's no simple design guidelines. So that's restricted the use by consultants and clients. And in fact, we've got a client in California at the moment where we've offered a, a reef as part of the solution to rebeaching Oceanside City. The client and the council are very against geotextiles because of some failures that they've had in California. And same in Australia, there's been some failures, but there's been failures of rock as well, but failures of geotextile tend to be more noticed. The future, climate change is going to bring increasing pressure for protection and increasing uncertainty and suitable rock becoming scarcer and more expensive. Uh, bottom left there, you can see Collaroy in 2016 with the infamous pool in the on the beach and on the right, uh, we did a design and, and supervision of a, an emergency protection wall within the property boundaries off the beach. The reason for that was, um, as you'll see on the right, there were broken sewers, storm orders, unstable buildings, um, not good. So for the next generation, we need improved durability and sustainability. I'm hoping that the, we'll see the geo coral and the basalt fiber geotextiles take, solve those problems. Past advances have been driven by challenging projects, e.g. Naranek. So my challenge to the geosynthetics industry is the Rebeach Oceanside project. Base design is rock. Give us a viable next gen geosynthetic option. And we'll take it to the client if you can convince us. That project, follow us on, on LinkedIn. We're giving updates as it goes. It's probably one of the uh, most innovative projects in America at the moment. So resources, there's over 30 years of paper reports on projects and design. So there's a link by my simple papers. Searchgate has got my papers, papers WRL papers and, and others. So I'm open to questions. Go straight to our Q&A session um, with our speakers, Simon uh, Restall and Angus Jackson. So a big thank you to Simon and Ang um, Angus for your great presentation. Um, as always, it's now your turn to get involved. So please ask our speakers questions um, when you can via the chat box. And a big thank you to everyone who put forward a question whilst registering. So we'll kick off with some of those. Um, the qu first question we have has come in from the Northern Territory. In fact, it's a, a few questions, so I might just start with one of that. 
And it's from Kangley, who's watching from NT, asking you both, starting with you, Simon, could you provide detailed examples of how geosynthetics are being used in coastal structures within Australia to combat erosion and sea level rise? And I know you showed some of that in your presentation, but uh, Kangley's asking particularly in areas similar to Darwin. Simon. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, thanks very much for the question. Hopefully you've seen in the presentation that the inherent flexibility of construction using sandfill geotextile containers lends itself particularly to some of these more difficult, remote and vulnerable locations. So, um, you know, we saw the early adaptation of them, for example, in Maroochydore with the seawalls and the groins. Uh, but importantly, we're seeing uh, increased use in coastal structures, such as that example of Muskers Beach in Yapoon. But perhaps more pertinent would be the projects that we're seeing in the Pacific Islands and these vulnerable um, coral atolls, um, which literally are referred to as climate change adaptation projects. And due to their uh, remoteness and lack of rock, uh, sandfield geotextile forms are very um, applicable and uh, durable solution for them. Closer to home, we see examples of this in uh, certain coral atolls throughout the uh, Torres Strait Islands as well, and across to Cocos Islands, which uh, we worked in for a number of years. So absolutely in Darwin, um, these types of structures can be uh, designed and applied. Angus, do you want to comment on that? Um, I can see that you can see Kangley's question. It's quite, he has a few questions, but if you'd like to just comment on, on some of that, Angus. Yes, definitely. We've uh, used the geobags quite often in, in the smaller wave climates. It's actually much easier. So a lot of our Middle East projects have used, been similar to Darwin, type conditions. Uh, the other thing is that often we don't have the perfect filling sand. Say Darwin, I'm expecting it's going to be a bit silty. We've done a lot of work with, uh, sometimes we call it goop, but um, less than perfect sand. The, the Spanius job was very, very silty dune sand, um, but it, it still works. Um, I think that's all I've got on that. Thank you. Um, I noticed that in your presentation we talked to we had some international um, references and we've had a question that's come in from Boyan um, who is watching from overseas asking first Angus and then Simon um, asking what is the interaction between geotubes and waves? Thank you Boyan. Um, it, it's very different to rock because the the sandfield structures tend to be very hydraulically smooth. Um, so the, you get more laminar flow uh, over them. So this, that's why in part of my presentation that hasn't been shown yet, uh, I make the comment, don't use rock design formula because they, they definitely are different. But as I say, as one of the things that we find is, well, because it is laminar flow and because they are generally a heavier weight, we can have a lower crest height. You can allow for overtopping, which often is not what, not, it will destroy a rock wall. Uh, I think it's, uh, Simon, do you want to add to that? Thanks. Thanks, Angus. Yeah, thanks, Angus. Uh, I'll just add to that that, um, I don't, I don't want to repeat what Angus says, but I would agree with what he said. And that the filling of the geotubes or the geotextile sand containers is critical because that will influence the shape, that will influence the potential fluidization or mobility of the fill material. And I say potential uh, because it's very dependent on uh, the container, the wave climate and the size, but um, certainly from my experience, construction and filling repeatability and detail um, provides a great outcome and long-term uh, serviceability. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you for that, Simon. Angus, back to you. We have a question from Dane. Good afternoon to you, Dane. Asking you, Angus, we're frequently asked to provide geocontainers for scale protection in coastal environments. Our experience thus far leads us to not specifying these given concerns about design life and longevity of the solution. Could you please advise on how design life of at least 50 years can be achieved? Angus. As an RPQ in Queensland, we quite often have to sign off on the, the 50 year design event. Now, the, the designs can be designed for that. That's not a problem. With maintenance ongoing and, and any coastal structure should have maintenance, including rock, you, you can achieve a 50 year design life. We haven't done that yet, but the, yeah, you repair, maintain, you'll get it. Um, I mean, it is a specialized field. So, you know, you, should I say you, you have concerns, come to a specialist consultant like us, um, ICM, and we'll, we'll help you. And quite often we, go for rock, you know, and as I say, in part of my presentation that, that hasn't been aired yet, I, I say, well, you know, they're, they're two different materials. You know, sometimes the answer is rock, sometimes the, the answer is sandfield geo containers. Um, but very different and, you know, different uses, different design. Um, so I would query the approval yeah, you know, the, the 50 years seems to have come in as a as a structural requirement. I mean, sometimes we just want a temporary structure and a few years is more than enough. We don't need to design for 50 years. Uh, Simon, did you want to add to that? Thanks, Angus. Um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd come back to uh, first principles regarding the geosynthetic material itself and say that it starts with the correct polymer selection, the, cor the correct uh, UV stabilizers, antioxidants, um, and the physical performance such as abrasion resistance. So if you look at some of the structures we're seeing now at 25 years of real time in active surf zones, um, with real time exhumations from those structures showing uh, excellent retention of the original material properties, the trajectory is very, very strong heading towards 50 years anyway. And correctly, we're not there in real time, but the confidence is there that um, certainly, uh, you know, in a, in a submerged scale protection um, around, um, uh, you know, wind farms or um, structures like that 50 years, we know that the geotextiles will survive. That won't be a problem in an exposed environment. Um, well, we've addressed that. We can see how it's tracking, but um, I hope I'm around in another 20 years to uh, see how that looks. Thanks. We hope you are too. Thank you, Simon. We've had a great question that's come in from Steve, who's for you, Simon, who's Steve's watching from New South Wales asking you, Simon, the private housing sector often brings risk of contamination building waste, asbestos to our beaches. With the imminent threat of coastal erosion exposing contamination, what technologies could be used to contain contamination and mitigate coastal erosion? Simon. Yeah, Steve, great question. And one which is very close to me. Um, if we look at that in the broader context, what we see, for example, in Australia and New Zealand is we see a lot of historical municipal landfills which were um, uh, filled in the coastal zone and that coastal zone is now under threat of exposure. Um, so two cases come to mind, one in Dunedin, New Zealand, uh, the other in Stockton Beach, New South Wales. Both these um, historic landfills um, have been at risk and in fact have been exposed. So there are two things you can do there. One is, particularly as you allude to hazardous materials that can be contained. Uh, there are technologies using 
for example, geosynthetic clay liners, geomembranes, which are used in landfill and hazardous waste containment. So you can contain that hazardous material, and then you can uh, protect and prevent um, further exposure utilizing some of the systems such as geotextile sand containers and uh, filter layers, which we've seen. So contain and protect, certainly achievable with geosynthetics. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you for that, Simon. I'm just staying with you for now and then over to Angus. We've had a question come in. Has there been updates to the design guideline after WRL conducted a flume test in 2015? Kicking off with you, Simon. Yep, uh, great question. And WRL, uh, full credit to them and um, to everyone involved down there. They've done some fantastic work over the years. Uh, the most recent update in regards to the design um, relates to the introduction of the five cubic meter containers weighing approximately 10 metric tons uh, applied at Maruchidor. So you'll recall that there was modeling which was done um, prior to the to the upgrade and the construction there and then there was the uh, actual physical construction 2020 2022 and from that there's a an updated tech note from wrl which incorporates um uh from basically the one cubic meter 2.5 cubic meter and five cubic meter containers and that is available um by all means please contact me and i'll uh, make sure you get a copy of it thanks thanks simon angus uh just quickly where with each project, we're getting more data points on the stability curve, so it's becoming easier and easier. I think it's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we've had a question that's come in for you, Angus, in the first instance from Rajiva asking, are tidal rivers covered under coastal management programs? Thanks for that question. Definitely. So the, the, the tidal area is, is generally included in most coastal management plans. Uh, what we're seeing there is uh, we're designing for, for velocities, not, not wave forces. Uh, but the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Simon, a question has come in from Afnan. Good afternoon to you, asking, what is the practical application of geosynthetics in peat soil stabilisation? Simon. Thanks, Afnan. In interesting question. Um, I'm not quite sure how it relates exactly to the coastal sphere, but I certainly from a geosynthetic um, sphere, uh, peat stabilization would fall into, in my mind, two categories. One, um, reinforcement stabilization and uh, potential drainage. So um, absolutely geosynthetics have a, have a role which can be played there. Uh, it's very much a geotechnical uh, design and then uh, incorporating, as I said, drainage and reinforcement of geosynthetics. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Angus, do you want to comment on that? Uh, no, I won't add to it. I haven't run into peat in my career. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've had a question from Adam, and Adam's watching from Victoria, uh, asking you, Angus and Simon, um, I'm interested to hear any recommendations for design standards. Often we adopt overseas standards, e.g. BS 8006 for reinforced fills, basal reinfor reinforcement, but I'm keen to hear about other approaches that have been used successfully. Angus. Um, I'll see what Simon follows with this, but our experience is that Australia's leading the way with the, the design and the guidelines. We tend to use the, the WR, well, we do use the WRL guidelines and our own stability curves that we're developing. Um, Simon overseas, well, we work overseas, but we take the Australian standards. Simon, anything to add to that? Yeah, look, I'd make two comments. Um, 
firstly, in relation to the parent material, let's make sure we understand the geosynthetic standards and the application of um, the actual materials we're working with in regards to the geotextile manufacturing and testing. Then in regards to the structure itself, um, certainly from my experience, we didn't have design standards because we didn't have design uh, knowledge until such time as we uh, implemented that uh, extensive work with WRL. So, Angus, I'd agree with your comment that, um, you know, certainly a lot of people overseas uh, are really looking, looking to Australia and the work that we've done with uh, geotextile containers in coastal structures. And I think, um, uh, you know, we are, we are leading the way with current state of the art, but um, not looking at alternative specific design standards outside of uh, the information we have from um, the likes of WRL. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for that, Simon. Um, we've had a question about pollution that's come in from Peter, and Peter's watching from Queensland. Good afternoon to you, asking, what about the end-of-life pollution? Any plastic-type product in an aquatic or marine environment is doomed in the long run to end up polluting waterways unless deliberately removed at the end of life. How is this to be managed, or we do, do we just leave this legacy pollution? pollution to our children. Simon, you might want to kick off with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, Peter, great question. And um, look, you know, follow your heart. We absolutely do not want to leave a pollution legacy for our children. So again, please, let's come back to those first principles about understanding the correct selection of the polymer and its um, inherent stabilizers and makeup. When we do the extended abrasion testing on the uh, Elko rock type containers, and we look at the electron microscopy of the, uh, the fibers themselves, we're not seeing a breakdown of those fibers. We're seeing um, maybe a, a very light roughening of the outer area, but it's at a point that we haven't even been able to find a measurable limit for loss or uh, degradation uh, of those fibers. So point number one is correctly selected. I have a high level of confidence about the durability. However, the other point I'd make is that generally in structures, and Angus alluded to this, and the structures, regardless whether they're rock, concrete, or geosynthetic containers, the client, the owner of the asset, should look at the maintenance of them. And so from a geotextile sand container perspective, we have not seen direct failure of the Elko Rock products as a result of UV or environmental degradation. We have seen some failure as a result of uh, fishermen or uninvited uh, vandalism. And in those instances, we manage that, and we manage that by improving the amenity, providing things such as um, fish stations uh, incorporated into the geotextile containers, uh, so that the fishermen have got somewhere to cut their bait, somewhere to put their rods. Um, and for the client then, that if there is a problem, they're, they're regular parks and gardens guys or beach maintenance crews keep an eye on it, and they can be easily, um, fixed, repaired, or replaced. Um, so I, I think managing it is well within our means. And as I said, compared to um, some of the other terrible things we're doing as humans in terms of uh, polluting our environment, I really and genuinely don't believe uh, that we have a major problem there, Peter. Thank you. Angus, would you like to comment on the issue of pollution? Just very quickly, we often do a, a removal plan as part of our design. We haven't had to remove any any structure to date, but it's no well probably easier than removing rock. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Angus. Simon, we've had a question that's come in from Mustafa watching in WA asking you water permeability through geosynthetic tiles. 
Thanks, Mustafa. Interesting question. And I'm, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question in regards to geosynthetic tiles, but I'd make the following comment. And th this is a very important consideration of um, geosynthetics in, in all applications. When we look at a TDS, a technical data sheet for geotextiles, we will see permeability values, um, coefficient of permeability, etc. What we need, the first thing we need to remember always is that that is a clean geotextile in a laboratory environment. So the values which you see on those TDSs relate to the standard geotextile or geosynthetic by itself in a laboratory. What I would encourage people to do always is understand what is the soil geotextile interface. Um, how does that look? Uh, first design principles we saw in my presentation is we need to make sure that it's filter stable so that we don't have a um, an unacceptable passing of fines. And then the second thing is that if permeability for the structure um, is a critical consideration, let's make sure we test uh, the soil geotextile interface so that we understand how that's behaving. Thank you, Simon. Just staying with you for now, we've had a question that's come in from Rebecca watching in Queensland asking, Simon, what are the risks to the local environment using geosynthetics, i.e. microplastics? Thanks, Simon. Sure. Thanks for your question, Rebecca. And I, I absolutely respect that this is a very important theme and consideration uh, and I've got no problems at all uh, in having the discussion around microplastics again and I don't want to sound uh, uh, like a squeaky wheel but if we come back to those first principles of the polymer selection the UV stabilizers the antioxidants the correct manufacturing technique um, the risk and the actual measured release of microplastics as i mentioned before is on our products from uh, the elco rock type products is literally immeasurable at the moment which we're, we're trying we are aggressively through our r d program trying to push the boundaries of this to understand if in fact we we can get um a result so at least we can have that uh, dis discussion but at this point um it's, it's not measurable. We, we can't determine that. The abrasion testing, we can't determine. Uh, I assure you it will be an ongoing um, project for geofabrics because we recognise how important it is to uh, um, the general public and um, those which fortunately do clear, care enough about our environment. Uh, we do too because the last thing uh, we want to be doing is adding pollution, um, hence uh, the effort which we put into uh, the durability and um, design of the current products we're using. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for that. Angus, a question for you and maybe Simon, you might also want to comment from Martin. Uh, Martin is asking, what type of traffic is allowed above the surface of installed sandbags? Thanks, Angus. That's, that's one of my favourite questions. When we were Constructing Naranek Reef, we were continually asking Geofabrics for a more durable product. And Simon called me during the opening of the 2000 Olympics and said, yeah, your durable products on the screen now. And that was, if you remember the 2000 Olympics, they were riding horses across the, the, um, the stadium area. Um, and they did no damage to it. We have had, since then, we have had projects where there's been bike, um, motorbikes, cars, horses going across the, the landward end of a groin at, at Elliot Heads in particular, where the, the fabric's been fine. Um, the question may have been more about loading, which is just a, a geotechnical slope stability question. Um, no real difference to a rock revetment. Uh, Simon, did you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Angus. I'd agree with uh, everything you said there. I'll just make the following comment that um, 
the probably the only thing you really need to watch out for uh, are the cleated tracks of excavators, for example. So, uh, as a if, a if an excavator was to run over geotextile sand containers, it's not actually about the footprint or the loading. It's actually about the cleats on the tracks as they uh, come around the radius of the uh, the drive and trailing wheels. The uh, the tracks are open and uh, uh, then as they come down into the horizontal, the track closes and there is a risk of pinch or grab. Uh, it's fairly low, but we always encourage um, the uh, the contracts is just to put a, um, a thin layer of sand between on the top of the geotextile containers um, so that that uh, uh, excavator track, for example, um, you know, doesn't pinch the geotextile as it moves. But uh, we, we find them very, very uh, stable and durable as long as they are uh, well filled and correctly filled. I'll just put, make that point. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Just staying with you, we've had a question from Linda asking Simon, what's the biodegradability process of the geofabrics and what's the environmental effects? Thanks, Linda. Uh, again, coming back to the polymer used in the Elko rock products and and the geotextiles used in filter layers and rock walls. It's not just about geotextile sand containers. It should also be considered uh, the geotextile filters in high energy environments. So these polymers are not, I reiterate, not biodegradable. There are geotextiles available in the marketplace that are designed to deliberately biodegrade. But for the purpose of this discussion, that is a uh, separate application and a separate um, uh, consideration. But the Geofabrics products are not considered a biodegradable product, um, again, for the reasons I've explained in regards to the uh, polymer makeup there. Thank you, Simon. Angus, a question from Dilson. Dilson's asking you, Angus, what are the potential environmental impacts associated with the use of geosynthetics in coastal structures, structures, and how can these be mitigated? Thank you, Angus. We're finding generally with the the structures, the reef type structures, that the environmental impacts are very, very positive. Um, and no, because they form a, a great substrate. Um, I think we're going to go back to the rest of my presentation and there's a video in there. Uh, we haven't had a project where the adverse in environmental impacts have been significant. Uh, Simon, did you want to add to that? <laughs> um, I'd, 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 I'd say, uh, to be honest, I'd say that if we look at it as a um, whole of carbon footprint, um, the use of geotextiles and particularly geosynthetic sand containers uh, has a much lower carbon footprint, especially when compared to that of, for example, um, concrete structures or quarried structures uh, that are um, um, produced and then carted usually by truck or boat and barge to the, uh, to the site. So um and then if we take that a step further and look at some of the um marine life and vegetated state of uh, geotextile structures I'd, I'd say it has a very positive impact rather than a um, um negative impact environmentally that's been my experience thank you thank you for that simon angus question for phase asking you if a very small quantity of a cementitious material was added to the sandbag being filled in, the risk of failure due to bacteria damage will be mitigated and also extend the life further. Is that the case? We've done some investigation to this because um, turning the, the, the soft flexible structure into a hard structure seems um, like a logical move. The, the problem is then you lose the flexibility. One of the, the really um, good, one of the advantages of the, the bags and the tubes and the mega containers is that they're flexible. So you can get differential settlement and also 
they interlock very well so you you get two two bags on top of each other the, the pull out is is very high the friction's very high because they they tend to merge into each other the shape um, we haven't found a project where adding cement or, or similar we, and we have looked at various epoxies is worth the cost or, or the negative of turning a flexible structure into a, a rigid structure. Um, Simon, I'm not sure whether you've stiffened up any. Yeah, thanks, Angus. Look, the, the, the simple answer is no. Um, philosophically, I prefer to avoid the addition of any cementitious material um, for the, the reasons you mentioned. I, I like the flexibility. Um, structures move uh, both with time and wave and storm events. So uh, I would always prefer to see a uh, sandfill structure being semi-flexible as it is. Um, I certainly understand, and we, we see examples of this historically, um, uh, you know, back from the 40s and 50s of uh, uh, cementitious um, sandbags. Um, but I think it's a, it's really a different um, performance, it's a different application. And in those cases, some of those concrete bags, um, the outer skin was designed to fail. Uh, whereas here, uh, we're looking at a durable material and maintaining a semi-flexible structure. Um, so yeah, personally prefer to stay away from cement. Thank you, Simon. And we are getting to the end of this webinar. And particularly, once again, apologies to our live uh, audience that some of Angus's presentation didn't come through. So I would like, starting with you, Angus, just quite quickly, and then Simon, could you just leave our audience with the key takeouts from your presentation today? Probably the first one is watch the end of my presentation because I'll forget the key points. Um, one is um, Simon touched on it. You know, with these, we don't need to trap rocks from a long way away to quarry. Quarry's getting further away. Uh, rocks are becoming lesser quality. They, they split, so, you know, they the structure degrades. So very much they're, they're not rock. It's specialised um, design, but it, it's you shouldn't, because of the benefits, particularly the we call it designing for people. You know, we we work with nature, with nature-based solutions, but we've got to remember that the coastal zones all are ways about people, and often a structure that doesn't have the same durability as a as a rock structure might be the best solution. And we've found that in many places, particularly where we can have a low crested, you know, visually zero structure. Uh, I could go on for half an hour. I won't hand over to Simon. Thanks, Angus. Simon, closing remarks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm a bit like Angus. I could talk about this for a long time, but let, let's, let's keep it uh, focused. Geosynthetics have literally changed our modern world, whether it's um, from mining, landfills, road and infrastructure, and in the coastal zone, they give us confidence. They give us stability. They give us durability. They give designers confidence about the structures they're building that can be managed with certainty, particularly in the face of a changing world, um, climate change, potential sea level rise. Um, there are a lot of very, very reputable manufacturers and uh, designers out there Please do your homework, make sure you know the products that you're getting, where they come from and um, how they're manufactured. And um, uh, you'll have a, a great outcome with a, a long term project. Thank you. Thank you, Simon and Angus. A great summary. It is all we have time for today. And please join me in thanking Simon Restall and Angus Jackson for their time and also sharing such great insights and what is a very critical conversation. I'd also like to thank Engineers in Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics, for bringing this webinar to us today. 
please, we're always looking for areas to improve and make sure that we're you know, publishing things that you're looking for. So if you could take two minutes to complete a short feedback form linked in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leaders event. Thank you and good afternoon.